Dear Lord, just want to uh, just want to come before you in thanksgiving, Lord. You remind us, Lord, of your faithfulness, Lord. Uh, whether it's uh, to balmy days or Lord, to sunshine days, Lord, you are still there. So we pray that you give us the same uh, song of rejoicing in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, live, uh, where I live, my clubhouse uh, closed the indoor pool after September. So, uh, in the mornings, in September mornings, we were fine, very, very good, and everybody came out in the morning. But come October, mid-October, it was getting a little bit chilly. We wouldn't say cold. <laughs> and because I had a stroke three years ago, and my right side of my knee is numb, so in October, I started to think, how about exercise at night, too, as well? So my exercise at night is to jog in the pool for 30 minutes. But it's been getting cold. So I bought, for the first time this year, I bought a swim shirt. They call it surf shirt. So the first week, it was fine. But then one night, it was very cold, and I was bouncing around. And my friend said, wow, let's go to the pool. So I have to put on my new swimsuit. And I remember one day going down and I was bouncing and shivering and shivering because uh, my, my Malaysian body couldn't stand, the, couldn't stand the cold, couldn't stand any cold. So I asked the lifeguard whose chair was just on top of me, very close. I said, uh, how cold is the weather today? And he said, 22 degrees. I said, well, how cold, how cold is the pool? <laughs> what do you think? 27. Okay. I said, how come? I'm so cold. He said, actually, he said, it's just a feeling. <laughs> but it's really not that cold in the water. Okay. So I was ready the next day when the weather hit. 17. I was still waiting outside. So I said, oh, no need. I think it's the same question. <laughs> How cold is the weather? Is it 17? How cold is the pool? Is it 22, 26? OK, I got it. Many times in our lives, outside looks very horrible, right? Disastrous. But we can always be thankful to God because he's faithful to us. Sometimes our feelings tell us otherwise but he's always 26 to 28 degrees in our lives. Now, we are into Revelation chapter 7. So far, chapter 1 is the introduction. Chapter 2 and 3 are the seven churches. Chapter 4 and 5, uh, chapter 4 and 5 is the worship. 6 and 7, today, we talk about the great tribulation. And and the great tribulation answered a few questions. After the four horsemen came in chapter 6, the answer to the condition is that, what happens to mankind? After the four horsemen, it seems like nothing left, right? But there seems to be people who are saved. And what happened to creation? After the four horsemen, the whole, oh, it's supposed to be wiped out, right? Not exactly. And most interesting question in chapter 7, what happened to the Jews? So far, they have not been introduced. But in Revelation, you need the Jews to complete the whole story of mankind. So what's the condition of the world after the Great Tribulation? And believers, what happened to the church? And what happened to the Jews? This one we're going to ask. And what is God doing in this tribulation? Okay. So I want to say the first point is that through the tribulation, through all the things that are bad in their life, remember we can see his protection. Okay. Point number one, we see his protection. Okay, let's read uh, verses one to four. How about that? One, two, three. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth 
holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land and sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been called power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. So the Jews now are numbered. Now, uh, today we're going to talk about the wind. <laughs> Uh, the winds do not get much credit in our lives until, until the winds come very strong, until last two weeks ago when we had two typhoons in four days, right? After the first typhoon ended on a Saturday, we came for worship, okay? But then before the next typhoon came on Monday, I was at church, and we were having a short discussion. And because we knew the typhoon was coming, and predicted on a Wednesday. So I was at church on Monday. Another co-worker had, his, had the off day on Wednesday. And the worker had the Wednesday off day said, oh, please don't come on Wednesday because it's my off day. And then two of us know the next day is a public holiday. And we said, please don't come on a Thursday. It's a public holiday. So when did the typhoon come? On, actually, it came on Tuesday. <laughs> To satisfy everybody, but we don't <laughs> we don't know how the how how the wind play a p part in our lives until we know it's very uh, needy. And in chapter seven, there were four angels that 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 wanted to stop the winds from coming uh, on land, on sea, on anything. And here we see God's protection. On uh, and and the second angel, which is on verse two came out and say, do not harm the wind, okay? Now in the, it's, it's beautiful in Greek, okay? Verse one, there's a hina, in order to prevent any wind, there's the four angels. Their main purpose in life is to prevent the winds from coming. But the second angel in verse two, gives the imperative, do not harm the wind. See the, see the flow, okay? So it's very important that even though in spite of the tribulation and what had happened, we can see God's protection everywhere, okay? And the protection God in your life is invisible. You don't see him, right? But somehow you know, you can discern that he is helping you in your prayers, in your everyday life. And sometimes in your eyes that are frustrated with God, you find that everything in life is inconclusive. <laughs> That's how we do our homework assignment, okay? But if you have eyes of faith, you know that God is inescapable from your life, okay? And He's indispensable. And somehow in your life, you know it's indisputable because you have gone, lived so long just by the grace of God, okay? So, and not only that, the, the angel that came in verse 2 said, do not harm until what? We put a seal for those who are belong to him. So we, what's a seal? Okay, a seal in some say is an official mark on the document, sometimes made with wax, that shows it's legal or has been officially approved. Uh, Trevor will approve that. Huh? <laughs> so God put a seal on those who are his. So you and I are sealed by God's hand. Okay. Uh, why? Because here it says that we are the servants of God. So do not harm until I put a seal on the servants of God. Don't understand, underestimate the word servants of a God. Go back to the, go back to just now that PowerPoint. Uh huh. That servants of a God, the little phrase before verse four, it occurs only one time in the Bible. So you are the servants of a God. God calls you in Revelation servants of God. One time, servants of God, and one time, servants of God in the Bible. So through all this, God treasures you. God calls you the servants of God. What does it mean? We are precious to Him. We are protected by Him. Okay? And in Him, there's peace.
because we are belong to His. And God gave us that very, very honored title to be servants of His. Honorable, heartfelt, and the highest title that He ever gave you when you're faithful to Him, we call you the servants. Okay? And it's important to know that we are sheltered in Him, we are safe in Him, and we are secure in Him because we are His servants. Okay, the second point in second in Revelation chapter 7. First thing is that through all the things that are going wrong in this world, apocalypse, winds, typhoon, everything else, we understand that He is protecting us. There are winds around us to harm us, but He put a seal on us and said, do not harm, because they are my servants. Second point is that we can always shout His praise. Let's read verses 9 through 12. 9 to 12. 1, 2, 3. After this, I looked out, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, and all the angels who were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise the Lord. Glory and glory, wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. I was trying to preach this section and I was thinking, how am I going to preach this section? And I think of the days when I was young, growing up when we had school assembly. Do you guys have school assembly in Hong Kong? Yep, okay. And I went to boys' school. Okay. And do you like school assembly? <laughs> I don't like <laughs> Okay. Why? <laughs> because they check you what? When we were young, we were checked for our shoes. At that time, we have canvas shoes. And we always had to buy those uh, white wax, you know, to wax it. And most of the time, I forget to wipe it. And I forgot to clean it too. And they check you, whether your hair, your shirt is tucked in, and what else? I forgot. What else? Oh, very important, if you are late for school. <laughs> That's when they check we are late for school. And in our assembly, we have to sing the school song, and then we have to listen to the headmaster for, for a few minutes, what he wants to tell us. And usually it's an hour long. And do you know who gets punished? In the assembly, they punish people. Guy? No? Huh? I got punished before. Why? Because the assembly happens in the morning, and they know you're late. So if you're late for a few times, you get caned. I got my fair share of caning. <laughs> Bend down. Okay. Now, you look at this section, it's very much like an assembly. Okay. May I see the next PowerPoint? Okay, you see the first, verse 9, is that with the assembly, you have the who is admitted before God, who has access before God, believers, okay? Verse 9, there's a great multitude. And then you go to the assembly, everybody's standing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then you have the audience. The audience of one is only the Lord. Everybody assembles, and there's only the Lord. And verse 9, they are wearing white robes. And well, my, my shoes are not white enough, usually. <laughs> white robes stand for purity. How's your attire, okay? You have attire. Those who come before God, you have to be attire, okay? I don't know about shorts, okay? But you have to be attire. Uh, verse 10, and that's the headmaster's announcement. <laughs> Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Instead, for us, it's an acknowledgement, a confession of the Lord. And then we have the adoration. This is the part that's different. Angels standing around the throne, they fell down, they worship. That's the adoration. And awe and praise to God. After the great tribulation, you don't suck around and complain. <laughs> okay, all you do is you're still alive and you praise the Lord. Okay? And, and in the end, what do they say? This is only one time in the New Testament, they say amen twice. 
<laughs> That's very true. I have to look for all these little details. Amen in front and amen at the back. When you come before God in that great assembly in the sky, <laughs> all you do is bow down and worship and you say, Amen. Whatever you say, Lord, Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't this a great? Isn't chapter 7 a great assembly? It's great. You don't get cane, okay? <laughs> and you come to praise the Lord like nothing else. Okay, so, and here, and when you go to this assembly, you'll be so excited. You know why? This is also the only time in the Bible you have the word, the phrase, Abba God, three times. Verse, this is the only chapter. In verse, uh, verse 3, Abba God. Verse 10, Abba God. Verse 12, Abba God. One day you come before him, you'll be so thankful. You, it's like you, you call him like a family, okay? Or oh, my spouse, my husband, my wife, my children. You, my God, our God, our God who loves us so much. Isn't that great? That great assembly in the sky. After all that's gone wrong to this world, we can praise the Lord. We can shout his praise. Okay? When you go to that assembly, you don't hide. You just say, Salvation belongs to our Lord. Okay, the last point, because I know a lot of people rush out very early, okay? Uh, we have to serve His purpose. In the great assembly in the sky, we acknowledge we are on earth. All that matters is that we serve His purpose for us. Okay, let's read verses 13 onwards. One, two, three. Then one of the elders asked me, This in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. He said, they are those who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will spread His tents over there. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching will be their shepherd and will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away. Now you ask me, Pastor, where are the Jews? Which I will dedicate to the last section. Okay. Now the Jews, uh, it's their presence in chapter 7. And before that, they, they were not present in Revelation. And after Revelation, there were still Jews left on this earth. They were saved by God. Okay. Now who are the Jews? In the Bible, the Jews are the chosen people. And sometimes we call the the apple of God's eye, and they are the authors of the Bible. Okay, and you know many of you would know they are some of the most talented, if not the most talented people in the world. They are the most envied people in the world, and sometimes they're the most hated people of the world. Okay? But God, Jesus Christ is a, is Jewish. God in His plan used the Jews to bless the earth. How you see seven. In Revelation 7, you see the Jews, and they will be witnesses for the Lord in the future. And the Lord will save Gentiles and will save the Jews. Now, the Jews have a very hard time in, in life, okay? In the Second World War, six million, the next, next PowerPoint, six million people were killed, okay? And these are where they are killed most, okay? In Poland, 2.7 million. Soviet Union, 1.3. Hungary, 1.1. That's a lot. Okay, Romania, 404,000. Germany, 165,000. Lithuania, I didn't know there were so many. 130,000. And Netherlands, 100,000. There are a lot of statistics that are less than 100,000. But you know, a lot of people hate the Jews. Okay? From Muslims, okay? from people who envy them for their wealth, they hate the Jews. Uh, for those who like Hollywood movies, they hate the Jews. They hate the production. <laughs> because a lot of them are controlled by the Jews. Okay. So, but yet the Lord has a tender heart for the Jews. And in chapter 7, it tells us that he will reserve the Jews to do his witness. And the next PowerPoint, from verses 15 to 17, this is also a wonderful, this is also a wonderful uh, testimony. Now, if you look at verses 15 to 17, this is actually... It's very hard to understand unless you have the background of the Jewish people. Then you understand. This is talking about whether well, Jews are Gentiles, but with the Jewish background. One day, verse 15, we will serve him day and night in his temple. 
and because that is how the Lord delivered them out of Israel so that they will worship him. And this will, this will be uh, they and he kind of section. They will serve him day and night. And then he, he will spread his tabernacle over them. And then the sun will not beat upon the strikes anymore. And the Lord will be their shepherd. If you understand this, this is the analogy of the Exodus, whereby you see it reverse the lamb, the Passover in Egypt, and then the wilderness, the sun will beat upon them. But in the end, the heavenly picture, we will serve the Lord day and night, and we will, he will, will dwell, the word is dwell in, in King James, he will dwell with them. This is the picture of Exodus. One time I had to teach Exodus in seminary. And you know, a lot of people think the purpose of Exodus is to get out of Egypt. No. <laughs> if you get out of Egypt, it would have been on the Sinai. But you go to the end, God wants to dwell among them. So that's why the word, that's why this is what we do. We come to serve him, which is our work. We are his servants and we must be available to him. And he, on his part, we come to worship him in his sanctuary, in all for him. He will take care of our welfare. He will supply for us. In him, we have abundance. And in the end, the lamb will wipe away the tears from our eyes. He will be our warm, he will be our shepherd, and he will have affection for us. That's the wonderful thing. May I see the next one? Yes. You see in Exodus, you understand Exodus, you understand in the end. God didn't want to take them out of Egypt to go up to the mountain. God wanted to dwell with them, but of course they didn't want to dwell with God. Okay? It's very it's, it's very hard to draw them to dwell with God. Because all you need to do is count on him. You cannot count on your money or anything else. Okay. And and the most interesting one, I don't know if you see I have another one. No more? Do you have the last one? No more. Okay. Now, the word the lamb, the most, the most important person in the whole chapter 7 is the lamb. Repeated four times with three different prepositions, four different prepositions. One is before the lamb. Okay. And second one is to the lamb. Okay. It is in verse 10. Verse 14 is the blood of the Lamb. And finally, verse uh, 14 ends with the Lamb. Just the Lamb. Okay. The Lamb is the center of revelation. And He will be the center of life. Okay, to conclude, there's one song that you sing in Sunday school. I don't know if you would that. Oh, you've been this. It's got the whole world. Do you know this? Huh? In his hands, just sing it. It's got the whole world. In his hands, it's got the whole world. In his hands, it's got the whole world. In his hands. That's what it says. In Revelation 4, whatever that's gone wrong, even through the great tribulation, through Armageddon, through apocalypse, he's got the whole world in his hands. Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you, Lord. Even times are bad, Lord, no matter here, throughout, throughout the world. Uh, whether they're vaccine or no, Lord, we pray for those who can, who can see his hands. And Lord, we be his hands, Lord. Be, be, before we're Christians, we can see the doom and gloom, Lord. But Lord, in you, we, only, we can only see the deliverance, Lord, and the gifts that you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.